Welcome to the Scottsdale Heritage Connection Messenger Family Research Room at Scottsdale Civic Center Library. I'm community historian Joan Fadala. I want to give a special welcome to Scottsdale area military veterans in honor of uh, Veterans Day 2020. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your service and sacrifice, both during the time that you were in uniform and all that you've done uh, as a civilian and veteran since then. I also want to give a, a special thank you to your families who in their own way had their own form of service and sacrifice during the time that you were in uniform and when you came home from your service. And a, a, a group that doesn't always get recognized as being veterans are those Department of Defense civilian employees who served alongside the military often in harm's way and uh, are not as often recognized for their service to our country as well. And full disclosure, this is a very poignant subject to me because I too am a veteran. I spent 21 years on active duty and in the reserves in the U.S. Air Force. In fact, it was my assignment at Luke Air Force Base that first brought me to this area in the 1970s. There I met my late husband, uh, who was a fighter pilot and a Vietnam combat veteran. And also, I'm very proud to say, particularly because of the subject today, that my parents both served in World War II. My father was a, an army captain who served in Europe, and my mother was secretary to the quartermaster at Fort Knox in Kentucky during the war. So uh, saluting our World War II veterans and what was happening here in the Scottsdale home front is definitely a subject that's both, I hope, interesting to you, but near and dear to my heart as well. You know, this year, 2020, marks an important uh, historic milestone around the world, and that is it's 75 years since the end of World War II. It should be something that was commemorated all over the world in ceremonies, but unfortunately due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, many of those commemorations have had to be canceled. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes with you commemorating our own Scottsdale participation in World War II, both in the home front and those Scottsdale residents who served, and also those many, many World War II veterans who came to Scottsdale after the war and truly built a remarkable community uh, that we so enjoy today. And I, again, this I make as a tribute to what Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation. But before we get to World War II, let's put a little bit of our veteran service into, con into its context and say that Scottsdale really is a community uh, built on uh, by veterans and thanks to many veterans, certainly from what I call the Civil War triad of veterans uh, that really put Scottsdale on the map or paved the way for Scottsdale. Uh, the first of those would be Major General Irvin McDowell, who was a commanding general uh, during, uh, for the Union Army during World War, or excuse me, during the Civil War, uh, and at the end of the war was commander of the Pacific, based in San Francisco, but the Arizona Territory fell under his purview, and at the end of the war in 1865, uh, he uh, led the establishment of army posts in the Arizona Territory, one of which was named in his honor, Camp McDowell, later named Fort McDowell, uh, which is just east of Scottsdale uh, as we know it today. Uh, he was concerned that because this was a vastly undeveloped area that there needed to be a settlement near the camp in order to provide food crops for the soldiers, and their families, and the horses there. And so he encouraged the development of a hay camp, which became the settlement of Phoenix. And as you imagine the map, going from the hay camp in Phoenix to Camp McDowell, they certainly had to go through the area which we now know as Scottsdale. A few years later, in 1883, another Civil War veteran came to the valley. Uh, that was W.J. Murphy, who served as a, an Army officer in the Civil War, and then brought his family to Arizona Territory to first 
helped build railroad infrastructure in northern Arizona, but then came to the valley in 1883 to build the Arizona Canal. When that canal was finished in 1885, uh, that was certainly made the, the land along the canal ripe for development. And that lured uh, the, the third of the triad from the Civil War uh, here to be the first homesteader in what we now know as Scottsdale. That was uh, former Army Captain in the Civil War, Winfield Scott, who had been gravely wounded, nursed back to health by his very supportive Army wife, Helen Scott. And after the war and his recovery from his wounds, he continued his career as a Baptist minister and missionary in established uh, towns and churches throughout the West. Uh, he came back into the Army uh, in the 1880s, was serving in San Francisco at Angel Island, but came to the Valley at the invitation of uh, some of the Phoenix leaders at the time, loved what he saw, and then uh, homesteaded land along the Arizona Canal in 1888. He and Helen retired here after he left his army, his second uh, tour of duty in the army, uh, and from uh, the early 1890s on helped establish the town that eventually uh, was named in their honor, Scottsdale. And as they say, the rest is Scottsdale history. After several decades of peacetime uh, and a few other Civil War and Spanish-American War veterans settling in uh, the town of Scottsdale, uh, World War II uh, involved the United States starting in 1917. Uh, the first uh, draft was held and many uh, Scottsdale young men were drafted to serve uh, both in the United States and in, uh, in France, particularly during the war. Uh, a lot of home front activities with Liberty Bond drives, uh, our Pima cotton became an, an essential war material during that time as well as the food crops that we were raising here. And even students got involved in the war effort when they were students at the Little Red Schoolhouse uh, by uh, saving the, the pits from peaches and apricots, which then were collected and sent to the government to use in as gas mask filters on the front in Europe. So you never know uh, how things can uh, develop on the home front. But one of the most interesting aspects after the war was the establishment of the American Legion and uh, the World War I veterans that had come back to Scottsdale formed what is today the oldest continuously active civic organization in Scottsdale and that is post 44 of the American Legion. They, from the very uh, time they established 85 years ago in 1935, they got really involved in Scottsdale activities. Again, we were an unincorporated farming community, but thanks to the efforts of this patriotic and civic group, they hosted many youth activities, uh, civic activities, and were really uh, kind of what I would call the movers and shakers in the small town of Scottsdale at the time. So once again, veterans were leading the way in establishing and building Scottsdale. So now let's talk a little bit more about our topic today, and that is World War II. As we remember, we remember from history, the war in Europe started in September 1939, and the, America was just coming out of the Depression and uh, enjoying a time of peace. But our, our leaders, certainly President Roosevelt and others in Washington and our senators here in Arizona, saw that there was a distinct possibility that the United States would be drawn into this uh, emerging global conflict. In 1939, believe it or not, there was only one military installation in the entire state of Arizona, and that was Fort Huachuca. So our, our senators at the time, Carl Hayden and Ernest McFarland, began lobbying the federal government and military leaders that Arizona, with its great climate and weather, perfect flying conditions with clear skies, uh, an abundance of uh, unoccupied, undeveloped land, 
good rail connections, and uh, favorable labor and tax situations really made Arizona a prime place to establish military, especially training installations in preparation for uh, what could eventually involve the United States in that war. Uh, while these plans were being developed, uh, also Congress passed in 1940 the Selective Service and Training Act, which again called for a draft, uh, and that first sign-up was held on October 16, 1940. Uh, thanks to uh, the presence uh, on the internet, uh, on the, uh, the National Archives site and genealogy sites, we're able to see the draft cards of many of those young men in Scottsdale that were required to sign up. In fact, any, but any man between the ages of 18 and 35 were required to sign up. But here we see uh, George Cavalier of the Cavalier Blacksmith family, his draft card and his Scottsdale address. Uh, Bill Kimsey, uh, son of Mort Kimsey, uh, who had to sign up. Al Corral, the Corral Los Olivos family's draft card. And Jerry Lutz of the Lutz family, whose father was a World War I veteran. Uh, are, were just some examples of all of the youth that did sign up for the draft and for World War II. Uh, also, the Air National, or the National Guard was federalized, and there were several members in Scottsdale that were uh, mobilized as part of that uh, effort in September of 1940. And all of these early activities before uh, Pearl Harbor uh, had a, started to have an impact on Scottsdale High School, where uh, men had been signed up for the draft, and some of the young men uh, didn't wait to be drafted, but actually volunteered for the Navy, the Marine Corps, and also uh, the Army Air Corps, uh, and began their training. Uh, interesting, uh, on, sep on December 7th, 1941, uh, the Scottsdaleans heard about Pearl Harbor uh, through radio reports on the, the uh, radio stations in the area. Of course, this was before television, but the radio stations KTAR, KOY, and KPHO uh, not only reported the incredibly shocking news of the attack on Pearl Harbor, but then instructed all military personnel to report to their bases. And then, of course, our very own uh, namesake ship, the USS Arizona, uh, was sunk at Pearl Harbor, and that was, of course, a devastating impact to the local uh, community. I might mention, too, that uh, there was a small military installation for the guard that was located in Papago Park, and that's where the cavalry trained. And so during the uh, 1940, uh, early 1941 time frame, Scottsdale residents often saw the cavalry parading through Scottsdale on its, uh, on its weekend maneuvers. There was also uh, an African-American infantry unit that was stationed there in Papago Park. Uh, so we did have the beginnings of uh, some military activity in the Scottsdale area. But the first military installation to really be built from scratch in the Scottsdale area was Thunderbird II Airfield, which we now know as the Scottsdale Airport and Air Park. Let me give you a little bit of background on that. In 1939, again after the war started in Europe, uh, military leaders, particularly of the Army Air Corps and Hap Arnold, the, the commanding general, saw that there would be a need to ramp up pilot training. And so they came up with an idea of uh, uh, starting the civilian pilot training program established by the federal government and giving federal contracts to civilian organizations or civilian companies to begin training uh, pilots for service in the Army Air Corps. And these cropped up all over the United States, some affiliated with college campuses, others with airports, and some were built from scratch uh, and became small airports to train uh, pilots for the Army Air Corps at the time. Interestingly, 
a group from Hollywood that had aviation connections and also wanted to do their patriotic duty in preparation for entry into the war, decided that they would uh, go for one of these civilian uh, pilot training contracts. And so a group led by Hollywood producer Leland Hayward and with investors like musician Hoagy Carmichael, actors Henry Fonda and Jimmy Stewart, another producer Daryl Zanuck, got together and formed Southwest Airways uh, and got contracts for civilian pilot training in the Phoenix area. The very first of four that they established was uh, taking over an operation that already existed at Sky Harbor Airport. The second was a built from scratch uh, a training field in Glendale, which they called Thunderbird One Airfield, uh, which opened in May of 1941. Later in 1941, they opened a third uh, operation in Mesa called Falcon Field, and that eventually trained pilots for the Royal Air Force uh, coming over from England. They uh, found this a great place because they had perfect flying weather all the time, and they were not uh, in jeopardy of being bombed, uh, which was the case if they had done their training in, in uh, England. And then the fourth was Thunderbird II Airfield, opened in June of 1942, 10 miles north of the unincorporated town of Scottsdale. Thunderbird II Airfield was civilian run with a small cadre of Army Air Force officers to ensure that the military uh, flight uh, training was uh, adhered to. Uh, it was designed, uh, as the other fields were, by uh, California artist Miller, Miller Sheets. And when you saw it from the air, the buildings were in the shape of a Thunderbird aircraft with the control tower being the head of the Thunderbird. It's very interesting to see the, the pictures from, uh, that were taken from the air. John Swope, who'd been an executive working with Leland Hayward in Hollywood, and who was also a pilot, was chosen to be the field manager. A little bit of trivia about John Swope was that he was married to the Hollywood actress Dorothy McGuire, who you may remember uh, later, many years after the war, starred in Old Yeller and Gentleman's Agreement and other Hollywood films. And they lived in the area of Cattle Track in Scottsdale, renting a house from the Ellis family and uh, had many Hollywood soirees during the time that they were there because they attracted uh, Hollywood stars to visit the cadets uh, being trained at the field. In fact, speaking of Hollywood, because of the Hollywood connections, there was a real great patriotic movie filmed at Thunderbird 2 and Falcon Field and at various locations in Phoenix uh, during 1943 called The Thunderbirds. It's available on DVD uh, and it's a wonderful patriotic movie that really shows what the Phoenix area and Scottsdale was like during World War II. I highly recommend it. Uh, the planes that they flew at Thunderbird II were PT-17 Stearman biplane aircraft, a very forgiving first aircraft because this was, for most of the aviation cadets, the very first time they'd even been in an airplane, much less flown one, and this is where they earned their basic pilot training wings. Uh, they, they had very little instruments, in fact, uh, because they were doing visual flight rules, landmarks became important to them, and many of the aviation cadets later in life as they returned for reunions here uh, said that without being able to see Pinnacle Peak, they may not have ever found their way back to the, the uh, Thunderbird II airfield during their first solo flights. If you're interested in seeing what this type of aircraft looks like, you're very fortunate thanks to a nonprofit group who formed uh, several years ago, the Thunderbird Field II Veterans Memorial Group, who found an authentic Stearman aircraft in the Midwest, flew it into Scottsdale, had it restored, and actually put it on permanent uh, static display at the uh, the newly uh, rebuilt Scottsdale Airport Terminal, the Scottsdale Business, Aviation Business Center. Uh, so anytime that you want to drive by the Scottsdale Airport, you will see 
uh, a steer, an actual steerman painted in the colors that it would have been during World War II here in Scottsdale at Thunderbird II Airfield. Now, as I mentioned, uh, these fields, Thunderbird Field II, as I mentioned, were all civilian operated. And this became a great employment center for war work for Scottsdale residents who left their uh, small businesses or their, their homemaking duties or their farms to work at Thunderbird II. So let me just tell you about a couple of these civilian employees who, after the war, became very important in the development of Scottsdale. First and foremost, I'd like to mention Malcolm White, a Scottsdale High graduate who was a small business owner, owned a cafe in downtown Scottsdale when the war broke out. He was also a qualified pilot and so became an instructor pilot at, at Thunderbird II Airfield. <clears throat> After the war, he uh, opened a few more businesses in downtown Scottsdale and coined the phrase, the Westmost Western Town, which has still continues as our town slogan. And uh, most importantly, when Scottsdale incorporated in 1951, became our first mayor. Another familiar name is Dorothy Cavalier of the Cavalier Blacksmith family. She became a, a, a parachute rigger at yeah, Thunderbird II airfield, a very unusual uh, career field for a woman at that particular time. And it, when I interviewed her many years ago, she said, oh, and it was great pay. She said, I made $125 a month, which was really a, a big deal in uh, 1942 to 1944. Another pioneering woman who worked at Thunderbird II was Lucy Lutz, who was one of the very first women to be uh, certified as an aircraft mechanic. Uh, she came from a, another good military family. Her husband, Carlton Lutz, was a World War I veteran and one of the founders of the uh, American Legion post in Scottsdale. And their daughter, uh, Virgie Lutz, who had married Alvin Brown, who was serving in the Army during World War II, became a switchboard operator at Thunderbird II Airfield. Uh, both uh, Virgie Brown and Dorothy Cavalier, after the war, were early town clerks for Scottsdale. And another person I'd like to mention who gave up one career to have another during, dur throughout the duration, as they call the time of World War II, was Mildred Bartholo. She was the operator of a guest ranch uh, located in downtown Scottsdale. In fact, it's right where the garage is for Civic Center Library, but that was the Adobe House guest ranch. Well, since tourism was pretty much non-existent dur during World War II because of rationing and because of military service, uh, she closed the guest ranch during the war and became the chef, if you will, of the dining hall at the Thunderbird II airfield. So the cadets, although they were preparing for war, were well fed uh, during the time that they were uh, at the base. And I might mention that during the two and a half years that the base was operating at Thunderbird II airfield, 5,500 aviation cadets earned their wings. Another group that had a very significant employment role at Thunderbird II Airfield were members of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. They all supported the war effort by doing their uh, civilian work at Thunderbird II Airfield, but they also set the stage for what has become uh, 75 years later as uh, one of the top three employment centers in the entire state of Arizona, and that is now the Scottsdale Airport and Air Park. So who knew that uh, those uh, loyal war workers at Thunderbird II would start something that is so important to Scottsdale today? And in fact, the entire uh, Salt River Valley or Valley of the Sun, the greater Phoenix area, during World War II, with all of its military bases, those four Southwest Airways bases, as well as Luke Field and Williams Field, uh, made the Valley the largest flight training center in the entire United States during the war, and certainly launched aviation uh, as one of the key economic drivers for this area for years to come. 
Now there was another military installation on the other end of Scottsdale, uh, on the border between Scottsdale and Phoenix, and that was Camp Papago, which uh, Initially, it housed, as I mentioned, uh, National Guard units and a cavalry unit, as well as African-American infantry unit. But in 1943, Camp Papago opened as a prisoner of war camp, initially housing Italian prisoners of war, but then switching over to German Navy officers and enlisted personnel who were so far away from any water or, the, or their home country of Germany that they felt that the federal government felt that this was a pretty safe place to keep uh, Navy uh, personnel who were prisoners of war during the war. During the height of the uh, Camp Papago POW camp, there were some 4,000 U.S. officers and uh, enlisted personnel that were guarding and uh, and serving to uh, run the POW camp, which at its height had some uh, over 3,000 prisoners of war. Now, they weren't just housed there, they actually were sent out on very important work details with so many men serving um, in uniform. Uh, Somebody had to maintain the canals for the Salt River Valley Water Users, Users Association. So POWs were used to maintain the canals and they were also used to pick cotton and uh, harvest other food crops uh, on the local farms and ranches on Scottsdale. Again, uh, performing important war work uh, while they were POWs. They were known to have orchestrated several escapes, the most notorious of which happened on December 23, 1944, when 25 POWs dug a tunnel out from uh, the POW camp into what's now the High View area of southern Scottsdale. Uh, their plan was they had seen an old map and saw that there was a salt river uh, not too far from the camp and they were going to get to the salt river, build a raft and float down the river uh, all the way to Mexico and then escape and try to get back to Germany. Well imagine their surprise a few hours after their escape to find that there wasn't really a flowing salt river, it was a dry riverbed. So within a few days after hiding out in various people's um, uh, outbuildings and whatnot, they were all rounded up and returned. But you know, they didn't have that bad of a, uh, an, an internment there at the camp because many of them returned after they were repatriated when the war ended. And some uh, became permanent residents of Scottsdale when they came back from Germany. And they began holding reunions uh, with the, uh, some of the camp person, the U.S. camp personnel and Scottsdale residents. In fact, there's a wonderful book located here at the library about the Papago Trackers, which was the reunion group uh, about um, the, that reunited the POWs with, uh, with Scottsdale residents. Several other books have been written about it, both fiction and nonfiction, uh, about the camp and particularly about that great escape. So you may want to come to the library and see some of those. Now with all of this war work, both at Thunderbird II Airfield and at Papago, Camp Papago, plus war industries like Air Research, which built bomber parts near Sky Harbor, it really put a tax on housing in the local area and it created quite a housing shortage. So thanks to the federal government passing the Lantham Act, uh, Scottsdale was able to get some money, a federally funded uh, project to build a small uh, housing project in downtown Scottsdale called Thunderbird Homes. It opened in 1943 at the corner of Marshall Way and Second Street, about where the Scottsdale Museum of the West is today. And it, they, it was one-story apartments uh, and a recreation center. And it was a home, uh, apartment homes, for families of military uh, and uh, war workers uh, serving at, World, at uh, Thunderbird II Airfield, as well as military serving elsewhere. After the war, it became rental apartments and then was dismantled uh, due to a sunset clause in 1960. 
Well, there were many efforts on the Scottsdale home front that really supported our military uh, in uniform and the war effort in general. Of course, rationing, food rationing, uh, was a just the way of the world at that particular time, and Earl's Market, Chew's Market, and other food establishments in downtown Scottsdale helped people use their ration cards to the best of impact, and also uh, even passed out booklets showing people recipes, how they could stretch uh, their ration and make substitutions thanks to rationing. Gas and tire rationing not only put a crimp on tourism and travel, but also uh, impacted our garage owners like Mort Kimsey, who owned the Scottsdale service station and other uh, garages in downtown Scottsdale. Unfortunately, many of uh, our families became gold star families as we lost individuals uh, in, during uh, combat. Uh, and uh, one of the sad duties performed by at least one person that I know of in Scottsdale, Labula Maori, uh, told me that she, for a time, had to deliver the telegrams to those families that she grew up with, letting them know that their loved one was either killed or missing in action. And she said that was just a horrific duty, but someone had to do it. And since she knew most of the people in Scottsdale, I think it was some comfort that they were hearing it from someone that they knew. Children in Scottsdale got involved in scrap drives uh, and paper drives uh, for the victory effort. Uh, there's a great photo of kids uh, collecting paper and scrap on Main Street that is in the library's collection. People grew victory gardens, again, to supplement their rationing uh, food, and uh, they also bought war bonds. In fact, this is a wonderful statistic about Scottsdale and showed how much we were into the patriotic war effort. The residents of Scottsdale achieved the highest per capita war bond purchase of any city and town in the entire United States, so yay Scottsdale. Uh, resorts, uh, who again were not seeing a lot of tourism during the war, hosted bond drives and also hosted military for their rest and recuperation stays. And private individuals opened their homes to cadets and soldiers for home-cooked meals. Uh, so there were so many things that were being done on Scottsdale's home front, just as they were, I'm sure, in the communities that many of you came from. Uh, and you have heard your parents and grandparents talk about. Well, as I mentioned, so many of Scottsdale young men were drafted or volunteered for service. And unfortunately, uh, about 25 Scottsdale residents that we're aware of gave the ultimate sacrifice. In fact, uh, there was a page in the 1945 Scottsdale high school yearbook, here's a Xerox copy of it, uh, listing the men that had lost their lives, that had graduated the, or that had attended Scottsdale High School. You can see that yearbook here in the Scottsdale Heritage Connection, um, here at the Scottsdale Civic Center Library. But some of these names perhaps you see on buildings or streets around here, Travis Sipe and Clayton Peterson, both killed in action. Uh, were the namesakes after the war, uh, for the post-44 of the American Legion. Stanley Cruz, who was killed in the war, became the namesake of the newly established uh, Veterans of Foreign War post here in Scottsdale. And George Hinton, who was also killed in the war, had a street named in his honor just south of what is now the Civic Center in Scottsdale. Those that were, uh, grew up in Scottsdale or were living in Scottsdale that came home after the war included people like Jerry Lutz of that famous Lutz family, uh, Bill Kimsey, the son of Mort and Clarice Kimsey. Many members of the Yaqui community and the Hispanic community served in uniform. George Doc Cavalier and his brothers uh, of the Cavalier family all were in uniform and several members of the uh, Brown family, Alvin and E.O. Brown, for sure, served in uniform. So many uh, young men who uh, grew up in Scottsdale did their patriotic duty. And there were a few young women who also uh, 
served in uniform, like Esta Smith, who joined the WACS, the Women Army Air Auxiliary uh, Corps. Uh, she joined up in 1942 and also served. So we're, we really owe them a debt of gratitude for their patriotic duty. But as I mentioned, civilians also served. Uh, perhaps they were too old or perhaps didn't pass the medical, but still had many skills to offer. And interestingly, several of the artists that were living in Scottsdale uh, performed interesting uh, war service. Lou Davis, who had been an oil painter living in Scottsdale before the war, uh, was uh, stationed at Fort Huachuca, which had a predominant uh, cadre of African-American soldiers because at that particular time the military was segregated. Uh, he noticed that most war uh, posters and brochures and information only depicted soldiers as Caucasians and so he really uh, empathized with the African-American soldiers around him at Fort Huachuca and decided he wanted to remedy that situation. And so he created a series of wartime posters and murals uh, for Fort Huachuca that depicted uh, the service um, of African-American soldiers. And those uh, were celebrated long after the war was over by special exhibits uh, hosted by the Library of Congress and the National Archives and are the subject of a book about Lou Davis uh, and his, uh, his tributes to African-American soldiers. Another artist that was living in Scottsdale and lived the rest of his life after the war in Scottsdale at Cattle Track was Phil Curtis, who became a member of the Office of Strategic Services, um, the forerunner of the CIA, and he created maps and did other secret work, don't know what that was, uh, during the war and then came back to Scottsdale. And of course, other civilian uh, war work included working in the war industries like air research, headed by Tom Darlington during the war, who after the war and uh, left that uh, plant near Sky Harbor, came to Scottsdale, uh, established the first working artist studio, the Arizona Craftsman Center on Main Street at Brown Avenue, and then became a real estate developer, most notably to uh, start the town of Carefree. And if you travel up in that area, you'll see the street, Tom Darlington, that name, was named in his honor. So after those war years of 1941 to 1945, and all of our patriotic duty, and all of the, our uh, Scottsdaleans who served in one way or another, we were so incredibly uh, pleased when May 8th, 1945, uh, heralded Victory in Europe Day. The Arizona Republic carried a headline that morning saying, VE Day is proclaimed by Truman as Germany quits. But the celebrations were, were tempered by the fact that there was still a war going on in the Pacific and many of our our own were serving in the Pacific and risking their lives every day. Well, a few months later, Victory in Japan Day was, uh, was marked on August 14th or 15th, depending on where you were on the international date line. And again, the Arizona Republic headline said, Japs surrender ends worst war. World rejoices. That's a tongue twister. I'm not going to say that twice. Uh, it, the governor declared that VJ Day is a state holiday, and people were dancing in the streets. Uh, sirens and horns and bells, uh, traffic car horns. I mean, it was just an organized pandemonium of celebration and joy that the war was over. Regrettably, Maricopa County war casualties numbered at least. 514, and interestingly, during the war, about 30,000 Arizonians had served in military uniform. You know, in today's population figures, that might not sound like a lot, but in 1940, uh, when we started preparing for war, the entire state population was only 500,000. So uh, that was still a pretty high percentage of Arizonians who served in uniform. As military veterans were mustered out, uh, 
they had seen what was available here in the Valley of the Sun and particularly in the Scottsdale area, having done a lot of their training here or nearby. And so they thought if they could live anywhere in the United States, why not come back to a place that had such great opportunities and in such a beautiful climate. And so they came here to launch careers, to raise families, and to really build a community that had their mark on it. So they started the next phase in the lives of, again, Brokaw's greatest generation. And they turned their service focus from serving their country in uniform to serving their community in what they called mufti or civilian attire. Unfortunately, many of those coming back after being mustered out were injured and bore war injuries, and there was a great need for veterans' hospital and health care. There were only two veterans' hospitals in all of Arizona at the end of the war, one in Prescott and one in Tucson, which really didn't help people coming back to Phoenix much. So after the POWs at Camp Papago were repatriated to Germany in early 1946, those uh, POW facilities were quickly converted at Papago Park from POW huts into a makeshift VA hospital, which opened on June 18th of 1946 and really became the very first hospital facility in the Scottsdale area. It operated um, serving hundreds of uh, returning veterans uh, through 1951 when a brand new uh, state-of-the-art veterans hospital was opened uh, on Indian School and 7th, uh, 7th Street. Again, uh, it was uh, not only a place for veterans to help recover from their war injuries, but it became a favorite charitable activity for Scottsdale civic groups as they formed, and also a celebrity stop uh, for celebrities to visit those uh, injured veterans. So again, as the veterans uh, returned to Scottsdale or came to Scottsdale to begin the second phase of their lives, they uh, had the benefits of the newly passed GI Bill, or the, the uh, Servicemen's Adjustment and Recovery Act, which had been co-authored by our own Arizona uh, U.S. Senator Ernest McFarland. And the GI Bill funded education, low-cost mortgages, and health care for returning veterans. One of the places that they turned to for education, particularly to learn technical trade skills, was a repurposed Thunderbird II airfield. After the war, it was taken over by Arizona State College, the forerunner of ASU, and it was turned into a technical trade school where the cadets had once learned how to fly. And their veterans used their GI Bill to learn skills like air conditioning technology, which was a brand new uh, field after World War II. And thankfully so for the Phoenix and Scottsdale area. They learned upholstery, they learned, learned auto repair, um, and many other uh, technical trade skills. But they also enjoyed peacetime college life. There were dances held there, and they actually built an intercollegiate rodeo ground up to Thunderbird II, uh, where they participated in rodeos. Um, they also began uh, a four-phase uh, build-up in Scottsdale that changed us forever from a farming community to what we are today. They started a baby boom, they started a housing boom, they started a business and tourism boom, and they also created a boom in civic organizations as they wanted to not only build a community, but continued the camaraderie that they had experienced while they were serving in the military. So within 10 years after the war, veterans really changed Scottsdale from, uh, from a farm settlement into the booming westmost western town, a place for tourism, for arts and crafts, for businesses, for neighborhoods, for civic groups, and eventually for incorporation, finally, as a town in 1951. There were so many veterans that were returning or re relocating here that it would be impossible to name them all. But let me just throw a few names out who really have made a difference in Scottsdale. 
Bill Arthur, who didn't grow up here but came here after the war, had been an Army Air Forces pilot. And he, uh, because of his interest in aviation, became known as the father of the Scottsdale Airport and Air Park, started the airport uh, commission once the Scottsdale Airport opened in 1967. He also was a developer, a civic leader, a Chamber of Commerce president, and was just, uh, but again, a, a real supporter of Scottsdale Aviation and the airport. Guy Stillman, who served in the Navy and was the son of Ann McCormick of McCormick Ranch, uh, was a lifetime train aficionado, and so uh, he started uh, this, the McCormick Stillman Railroad Park, which I always call the happiest place in Scottsdale, and was also a civic leader involved in many organizations. But his main charitable activity was uh, supporting and expanding the McCormick Stillman Railroad Park uh, throughout its development uh, from 1967 uh, until his death in the 1990s. Eldon Rudd was a, a Marine fighter pilot during World War II, uh, became involved in Arizona politics after the war and was a congressman uh, from Scottsdale who really was a champion of uh, building the Indian Bend Wash Greenbelt Project and other good things that happened in Scottsdale. Uh, as was Barry Goldwater, another World War II veteran who really championed many projects in Scottsdale. Dr. A. E. Carpenter, who was a chaplain during World War II, uh, became head of uh, Scottsdale Baptist Hospital, uh, which had opened in 1962 as City Hospital of Scottsdale and took it from a small healthcare facility uh, up until the, uh, the 1970s when it became a community hospital named Scottsdale Memorial. But he was a beloved civic leader as well as uh, a champion of medical uh, facilities in Scottsdale and really laid the groundwork for us becoming known as a major health uh, center. Lloyd Kiva, Wes Segner, Charles Lolomo were artists that created not only the Arizona Craftsman Center, but also many of the arts and crafts uh, activities that, that uh, really put us on the tourism map in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. They had all served in uniform. Lincoln Ragsdale was one of the Tuskegee Airmen during the war, came back uh, was as a business owner and was really a champion of civil rights uh, in the greater Phoenix area. Uh, and we really owe a debt of gratitude for his raising our awareness through his activism during the 60s and 70s and throughout his life. Uh, so many others. Don Fry served in the Merchant Marine and came here in the early 1960s to start a business called Prestige Cleaners, which is a, you know, an award-winning and recognized small business based here in Scottsdale. There have been mayors, there have been city councilmen, the architects Joe Wong and Benny Gonzalez both were World War II veterans and uh, Benny Gonzalez uh, was the award-winning designer of City Hall, the Civic Center Library, and the Center for the Arts, and Joe Wong designed so many buildings in downtown Scottsdale. So again, many, many uh, veterans, and I, I would be remiss not to mention also, uh, there were a couple of women that uh, certainly put an imprint on on Scottsdale residents and facilities after the war. The Women's Air Force Service pilot, uh, pilots were uh, women pilots during the war that did stateside duty ferrying planes between bases and doing training while men were uh, flying in combat. And Betty Blake uh, was a Scottsdale area resident who was, had been a WASP in World War II, and she talked to countless school groups, veterans groups, and civic groups about her work, wartime experiences and those of her fellow WASPs. And also an allied uh, veteran, a uh, veteran of the Polish army, Zina Kuhn, uh, was a prime civic leader in Scottsdale, and uh, one of her projects was bringing the 
Mercy train car, which had been filled with gifts from the people of France thanking the Americans for uh, helping them during and after World War II. And it had been abandoned in the desert uh, after it came to Scottsdale, or excuse me, to Phoenix in 1949. She orchestrated it being brought to the railroad park and beautifully restored, and now provides the backdrop for Scottsdale's veterans' activities. Veterans groups uh, boomed after the war, uh, not only as civic organizations, but as a really important place for veterans to meet with their peers and to be able to help get over some of those wartime experiences that, that were so traumatic for them. Post 44 had a boom in, um, in membership and they uh, built hand built their own Legion Hall on uh, First Street in 1948 and then offered that hall as a civic meeting place until the town was incorporated and could build some of its own meeting places. And the VFW, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, established their post in 1946, initially meeting at the Little Red Schoolhouse until they could build their own uh, VFW post on Scottsdale Road. Other veterans organizations formed and again continued serving not only their community but their fellow veterans and many youth groups providing mentors and perhaps inspiration for future generations to serve their country. And now I, I want to make sure that we realize how the many ways that we in Scottsdale continue to honor not just World War II veterans, but veterans of all wars and peacetime service. We have many uh, places that you can visit, uh, hopefully in a safe, uh, socially distant and masked up way, but uh, certainly there are several war uh, memorials located at McCormick Stillman Railroad Park. The Garden Club provided the Blue Star Memorial located there. The Mercy Train Car is certainly a veterans memorial. The Admonson Car, uh, which, federal, uh, which uh, FDR, President Roosevelt, used during the war uh, to go to important war meetings is now um, located at the park and also located on the National Register of Historic Places. As I mentioned earlier, we have that wonderful uh, World War II Veterans Memorial Stearman aircraft located at Scottsdale Airport that's uh, always available for uh, public to visit. Uh, we have Veterans Memorials located at some of the cemeteries in the area, Green Acres, Paradise Memorial, and Camelback Cemeteries. Uh, the Honor Flight Arizona is a, a civic organization based in Scottsdale that raises funds and accompanies World War II Korea and uh, Vietnam veterans on trips to Washington, D.C. to visit their memorials. Students of Cactus Shadow High School in, 19, in 2005 began an oral history program with local veterans and uh, now it has expanded to other area high schools where they interview veterans, uh, do essays about the veterans uh, in a book that they publish every year called Since You Asked and also send those uh, those veteran uh, oral histories to be on permanent uh, uh, repository at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And also there's a wonderful uh, tribute to chaplains and also other military in the form of a chaplain statue behind City Hall where also on Memorial Day and Veterans Day they often hold services. So again these are just a few of the veterans places that you can visit um, anytime in Scottsdale and pay tribute to past, present, and future veterans in Scottsdale. So I hope this gives you a glimpse of what Scottsdale was like uh, during World War II, a salute not only to the home front and what was going on here, but a real tribute to Scottsdale's World War II veterans, those that grew up here or those that came here and made Scottsdale the community that we know and love today as our own hometown. Certainly these World War II veterans uh, uh, were inspirations to further uh, generations of, of veterans that served in the Korean War and the Vietnam War, during the Cold War in Desert Storm in Afghanistan and Iraq. 
uh, in peacetime, in combat, wherever our country has needed veterans, uh, Scottsdale has, uh, has answered the call. So how fortunate we are in Scottsdale to have veterans play such an important part in the development of our community. And we can never thank them enough or their families for inspiring us and for serving us. And we again thank them. Thank you.